Thank you for coming uh, to this, uh, this town hall meeting here to discuss uh, recent events uh, that you may have heard about, um, obviously, regarding the West Area Specific Plan and uh, our decision to move ahead um, with a suit to try to get some answers uh, that we need in order for us to prepare for the development. So, before we get started, uh, uh, there are microphones and we have translation uh, in the back. Amy and Wynn, would you guys wave your hands in the air? And then... Muy buenas noches, gracias a todos por venir a esta junta importante de la comunidad. Si ustedes gustan escuchar esta junta en español, tenemos audífonos en la parte de atrás con Jennifer y con Amy. Ellas están levantando las manos. Jennifer y Amy, este, por favor, vayan a la parte de atrás. Ella les va a dar unos audífonos para que escuchen toda la junta en español. Muchas gracias. So before we get started, I just want to interview, uh, or excuse me, introduce uh, a few people. Uh, to my right is it's this is the Santa Rita district team. This is my this is my team. Uh, first, the assistant superintendent of educational services, Melissa Alderman, Rosa Zamudio, our chief business officer, Nadine Dermody, our uh, director of student services. Becky Moore, our Human Resources Director, and Victor Sandoval, our MOT Director. Uh, over here, we have our, our consultant for Cooperative Strategies who's been with us from day one, Corey Burbach. Uh, the attorney representing our, our district in this is Devin Lincoln from Lozano Smith, and then our board president, Sarah Turner, on the far right. And then there are a couple people in the audience I'd like to uh, recognize. Mr. Dan Burns, the superintendent from the high school district, is here tonight. They have joined us in this endeavor, and our appreciation certainly goes out to the high school superintendent and his board. Uh, we also have a couple of our, 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 our not attorneys. These, these guys, <laughs> these are architects from uh, Singapore Finney, uh, Mark Finney and Don Barry. I just call them Mark and Don. It's like a radio broadcast. <laughs> and then all of our principals are here, uh, you know. And I just want to, I just want to thank them for all their hard work. I also see several staff members here after a long day teaching. Uh, they make time to come out and, and spend the evening to make sure that the teachers uh, can share their perspective as well. So, with that in mind, I just want to go ahead and get started. Uh, the reason we're here tonight is simply, we're not, we're not really going to talk about the development per se, about all the particulars of that. We will have several more meetings uh, regarding that once the time comes. But uh, over the past three years, we have been meeting with uh, the developers in the city uh, regarding this development. And over the course of those three years, uh, the conversation um, that was taking place uh, back in the fall of 2016 and early spring of 2017 when I arrived here is basically the same conversation that we had uh, that I had with the developers on December 17th and it's there was no movement we were receiving no answers we were asking for things like a phasing plan so we would know where where we would have to start looking to build a school first uh, the, you know there was questions about uh, the traffic around the schools, there's, there's questions about storm drains, there's, there's a lot of questions that we have, and the simple fact of the matter is the suit is to try to help get us answers. We're not looking for money, we're looking for answers. Um, you know, we just want to make sure that when this development starts, we can start building a school, because it takes longer to build a school than it does to build a house. And so in order for us to be ready when those children are ready to go to school, uh, we need to get started. We made an offer on the property. Uh, we've made we've made a couple of offers to try to settle this uh, and receive no responses. Uh, we didn't receive rejections. We just never received a response. Uh, the only response I could get when we talked to him was, "We just need more time. There's no way we can do this now. It's not going to happen." Uh, and uh, we had a time clock that was running from the time the city passed the EIR the time where we could you know, access courts to try to get answers. And so that's where we're at and that's why it happened. So um, really, I want to make a couple of points that are important. 
First, we are not trying to stall or delay or, or in, in any way not have this development come into Santa Rita. We're, we're excited about it. If you take a look at this, this is going to be a really beautiful addition to the Santa Rita uh, neighborhood. We're, we're excited about the opportunity. We don't want to keep development out of Santa Rita. We just want to make sure that we get Santa Rita into the development. And you see the three blue squares, or two squares and a rectangle, and the one's a little bit of a lopsided square. Those are all school sites that were approved in the EIR. Unfortunately, we have not been able to get a purchase price. We, we made an offer uh, on the first site uh, over there. The actual, the, the bottom one there is McKinnon. That's the school we're in right now. So the other one, the next one up, the Sobrano site is the site we made an offer on and we were told we don't own that property so we can't sell it to you. So there we were. Uh, no guarantees that we were going to be able to purchase these sites. No, no assurances uh, from anyone in the city or the developers that we were going to be able to take that, you know, acquire those sites. And then we've got all kinds of questions about the traffic. Uh, and that is an environmental concern and we're, we're moving forward with that to address that as well. So the one thing I want to mention, uh, you know, you, you may wonder why we're so concerned about acquiring the sites. Well, I would just draw your attention to the building that you're sitting in. This school site was originally a little blue square in the Hardin Ranch development. And for whatever reasons, and I wasn't here at the time, but this site got built across the street. And for the last 20 years, we've had 100% student transport to this school. Nobody's been able to walk their child to school. The, the kids can't walk to school. Parents have to get up in the morning, get their kids dressed, get them in a car, and drive them or they have to wait out in, at the bus stops and, and get driven the five blocks across Veranda to here because we cannot ask students to walk across that over the city. It wouldn't be safe. So the, the main purpose of our fear or our apprehension for us not having a commitment on these sites is because of this school site. This school site was supposed to be in the, uh, the Hardin Ranch development and it didn't go in. And I have a teacher who happened to email me the day after, and I believe I see her sitting back there. I'm not going to point her out. She sent me an email saying, thank you, Mr. Ryan, because 20 years ago, I bought property, I bought a house in the Hardin Ranch with the promise that there was going to be an elementary school right across the street from me, and then it, it ended up over here. And she paid a premium for the price of the lot, and it didn't show up. So it's not just about our district you know, uh, making sure we have sites, that's the most important thing. But it's also to make sure that when people move in and they're told there's going to be all these schools in there, that those schools go in. Because what we've said from the beginning, and the board and I made this a point, that we were determined that we would have neighborhood schools for neighborhood kids. That they, if they wanted to, they could walk to school and a parent could have the opportunity to walk their child to school and be waiting for them when they walk out in the afternoon. And that's the commitment that we're going to make to the parents and the community members that aren't even here yet. We're already representing them. So, uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that, uh, that we are doing our due diligence and making sure that we get those sites acquired and that we make sure that the traffic around them is safe. So with that, I'll go ahead and open it up. Anybody that wants to ask, this is a town hall meeting. You are free to ask and I will respond or get somebody up here to answer your question, you don't come up and speak for three minutes and then get told thank you. You're going to have a chance to get your questions answered as well. So I imagine if you're here, then you're here either, hopefully not just to listen to me, but to actually engage in, in a dialogue about this about this endeavor that we're undertaking. So is there anyone here who has any questions? Why are you stalling the problem? I'm sorry? Why are they Okay, the question was, why are they stalling and not selling us the property when we're asking, hey, we've got the money, the state has given us the money for the first site, we made an offer with that money, uh, and it was actually more than what they were going to pay the owners. So, my answer to your question is, I have no idea why they would not sell it to us, I don't know, because... 
it's on the map, it's been approved, we have the money, we made an offer, and they they wouldn't do it. And I guess I could, uh, I don't know if it would be appropriate that you explain that they do have rights to negotiate that we could, we could have sold it because that's the information that they probably would be able to do. So this is Corey Burbach, he can explain to you how that, that process works with as far as the developers negotiating for uh, the properties. Thank you, Tim, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so to expand a little bit further on Mr. Ryan's uh, point is that we have been, again, meeting with the developers for the last four years. And the, the ownership group has been uh, represented by three individuals. Those individuals have communicated to us that they have the right to negotiate on behalf of, and I don't know exactly how many, but a number of different owners who have property within this development. Our request to have them execute some sort of purchase agreement at a fair market value that will be appraised, that's already been done, have been denied. So the, just like the city has worked with a few of the representatives, we've been working with those same representatives. We just haven't been as successful as the city has because we don't have anything that says whether we have any say on whether the project is approved or not. So that's where we're standing at today. Because we don't have any say, we haven't been getting the same respect. Yeah. Right here. And then it seems to me that the, the developers have to submit a tentative plan. And they haven't done that yet. Is that right? But on their subdivision, they have to provide a tentative plan. And then things start rolling when that tentative plan is approved by the city. Okay. Corey, I know we've talked about that. You've done a search, right? Yeah. Uh, so right now, where our understanding is, the city's at, they've adopted an ordinance to essentially rezone the, the west areas of the plan. So if you look up, all of the different neighborhoods have lot densities. So we have an estimate as to what the number of units will be within each neighborhood. What we don't have, and what we request here, are tentative track maps, plans as far as what a, what a neighborhood track would look like. And at this point, we aren't aware that they have any designs for what the, each track would look like, or that they have submitted any track maps to the city for approval. My concern is that, I mean, with all the, with the process of, of uh, dedication of that acreage, the semi, public acreage in the zoning process. And when that takes place, then uh, that's when uh, the, the ball starts rolling. If they don't own the property, I don't know how the heck they can be negotiating anything at this point. So it may be just a timing issue. So we've asked for clarity on, with respect to options agreements, you know, with who we're negotiating with, what, what ability do you have um, to actually execute an agreement. You know, we've asked for copies of the options agreements with the assumption that with the current landowners, the prospective developers have the right to purchase that land at some point. We haven't received any of that. Um, our requests have been not necessarily denied, but gone unanswered. And so unfortunately, I just don't have any additional information as far as what their actual right is to negotiate or what their plans are for those those sites that they don't currently own. Has anybody checked into the financial stability of the developer? <laughs> no. <laughs> that's, that's a good question, but no, uh, we haven't. So uh, that's an interesting question. Background check on No. Yeah, it would be, uh, yeah, I don't even know where it's going to be responsible for oversight. Just the lender, I guess, whoever they need to Okay. Well, we may hire you. <laughs> well, we appreciate your help. Anybody else? Fire away. This is the chance. Good. Lawsuits, what is the lawsuit specifically asking for? Well, that would be a long answer, I imagine. Uh, you can speak to that. So, this is Dan Wigan. Dan's version. Okay. Oh, boy, you're talking to the wrong person. 
one person. <laughs> Sorry. Um, hi, I'm Devin. Um, I represent the districts, both districts. Um, this lawsuit is specifically targeted at the environmental impact report that the city approved on December 17th. And um, as Tim mentioned, there's a short statute of limitations to challenge the sufficiency of action under the California Environmental Quality Act, which is what this is. And so specifically, the districts are alleging that the EIR is insufficient because it did not adequately ad analyze the impacts that would occur if these sites aren't built and students have to be accommodated in the sites that Santa Rita and the high school district currently, op currently operate. And secondly, that there is no phasing plan associated with this. So we don't know where this development is going to start, how dense that construction is going to be, and when we're going to need what we need. And for those reasons, we believe that the EIR is insufficient, and that has a negative impacts on the environment and go just go beyond schools as well. And so we're asking the court to invalidate the EIR and ask them to, re to, um, to review their own efficiency of their environmental action. Thank you, Devin. Anybody else? Is Salinas involved in the lawsuit? The Salinas High School District? No, the Salinas High School District is, but not the elementary school district or nor Alice. Let's answer the question. They're, they'd be in the central and the uh, eastern plan. I'm sorry, they'd be in the central and eastern plan. The question was, is either of the other elementary school districts uh, in this lawsuit? And the answer is no. Uh, the high school district joined because they are impacted by the West Area because they have all the high school students um, in the entire city. Uh, and their high school that was built, uh, you know, in, on this map that they included as one of the schools that's built for this was actually designed uh, to accommodate uh, the, the overcrowding of the existing schools. And I, I don't want to speak for you, Dan, but that's my understanding. So. Uh, so the high school district, in an attempt to uh, handle the overcrowding, sometimes five, six, seven hundred kids more than what those those sites were designed for, built that high school to try to alleviate that. So there there will be a definite impact on the high school district with this development. So. And, and you mentioned the, the traffic pattern. Uh, you're supposed to be in a urbanization process or smart growth. So it wasn't really developed to take care of, uh, of uh, people walking? The question was, the city has promoted this as a, 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 a development referred to as new urbanism, which um, if, you, if you do any research on new urbanism, it usually occurs in urban areas, uh, not in small cities, you know. Secondly, it occurs somewhere where there is a, a, a big job creating entity, whether that's up in, you know, Los Gatos or whatever, where, you know, you have Google and, and, and businesses like that, or a big university in Palo Alto or something. Something where there's jobs within walking distance or bicycling distance. That's what helps create that new urbanism where they kind of turn away from cars and go to other modes of transportation. And you can see there's, there's, I guess they could go to work at Lowe's, uh, but you know there's not there's not a job source anywhere within walking distance other than uh, the malls and things over on North Main Street. So it's a good question. Or, but is it school sites, in other words, <laughs> is there proper walking paths and, and, and other uh, 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 alternative modes of transportation other than vehicles to take your kids to school? That's a good question, and we're going to ask that as soon as we get to court because that's, we can't get an answer to that question. We've asked that question. Uh, we can just look at this map real quick if you want and just point out a couple of things. If you notice the school district, this is McKinnon where you're at right now. This is the first, or they call it the second elementary site, the middle school and the third elementary site. So when we, when you, when we go to their meetings, they'll say, this plan includes five new schools. One, two, three, four, five. But this plan includes three new schools because the other ones, this one has been here for 20 years. The high school district was built two years ago. And so there's, no, there's only three new schools that are designed. And if you're going to have a neighborhood that is designed for walking and bicycling and all that, it makes sense that you'd have neighborhood schools in, in the development so people could walk and, and not have to take their car to take their kids to school. So 
that's why, that's another, but we can't get the answers to that question either. So you're going to ask me a lot of questions tonight, and you're going to probably be as frustrated as we are, because we, we've been trying to get the answers to those questions that we just haven't been able to. But these are the great questions that are being asked. building, there's apartments building, there's stores building, and um, I, I have a, I personally have a very good memory from the city of Gonzales, that I used, I, I went to the, to La Gloria, to Bellevue, to high school, so it was very easy for my parents, for myself, to go to one school, to the other one, and then to the other one. So, they were going to build um, apartments there. And I also attend to that meeting, and because I have nephews, and and um, that they go to the to the school, and we say no, we're gonna just keep it like that. So, do you think it's this is happening because of the community that is not getting involved? Because I personally think that my priority are the schools for the kids, for the new generation. If they don't build no schools, come on. What's going to happen with Salinas with our kids? They're building more more jails. How come? How can they don't build more schools? Yeah, and we're not even asking the city to get involved in building schools. We're just asking, you know, can we can we at least get a guarantee on these properties so we can build the schools? We're not asking for money. A sequel suit would certainly not be the, the the proper channel to take if that was the case. Uh, we're trying to get answers. Uh, several answers here have been asked tonight that we've been trying to get the answers to for a long time. And then the final thing is just simply, you know, we agree. What you're saying is what I've been saying. Neighborhood kids deserve neighborhood schools. Right? So are, earlier you said, are they filling McKinnon as a school to house the students that are in the neighborhood that's going to be built around us? Yes. What are we doing with the 500 kids that come from my neighborhood? Yeah, we got to we gotta, they gotta go to school too. That's why we need these sites, right? So you've already picked up on, yeah, this school is, so what we're seeing is this property right here, you can see little dash lines. That's the property line here. This is one of the developer's property. This is Mark Kelton's. Uh, this property along here, is belongs to Ray Herrick. So these are the two gentlemen that we've been negotiating with. So this school was supposed to go over here, and it went over here, so all these kids over here are coming in here. There's like 500. Right. These schools were designed by CDE. They're rated at 700. Uh, you, you start going over that, Dan can attest that they've been doing it for a while. That's why they needed this new high school. So. They, but they've counted all five of these in this, and, they, uh, and, and I, at their, at their town hall meeting in June last year, I talked to Tara, I think, I can't remember her last name, but I said, that's not a, <laughs> that's not a new school for this development. That school goes to Hard Ranch. She goes, it's in the plan. And I go, but it, it's not a new school for this development because it belonged across the street. It's in the plan. So and so I said, okay. I bought the house, so I know they do the misleading thing. Dang. The sign in front of the spot said, future school. That means there's a school going there in the future, not potential future school. So if they're going to peg McKinnon as a school for that neighborhood, where do they want us to send the 550 children we already have? They're going to stay there. My room's big, but it's not that big. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're going to keep, we are not going to uh, inconvenience or make a hardship on our existing students or parents or families. But uh, I just got this picture of what you're just talking about. So this is a picture, future school site, this school across the street. So here it says. And that's because nobody said, wait a minute, where's our school site? We want to buy it. 
stop right now, stop. You're not, we're not going across the street. Uh, so that's what we're here, that's what we're doing. Uh, you know, and, and really, you get back to an interesting point. I had somebody ask me earlier, um, last week, you know, what's this gonna cost? <laughs> going up in my office right here. I'll let my board president hold that for a little bit. They'll, they'll tell you, I've been a little bit crazy the last couple of months. It's, I said, it's all about the sites. It's all about the sites. We've got to get the sites. And they go, what about funding the schools? And I go, let's get the sites. We'll, we'll worry about funding the schools when we have a place to build them. Because this school sits out here, and every time I drive by it, it's a, it's a reminder of what can happen when people become apathetic. And, and don't take action because that's what they were counting on. I guess I don't know how they. I don't know the thought press process. I'm not really certain, and so I can't answer questions as to why they did or didn't do so. But I can tell you what I've told people when they ask me what the cost is. I'll tell them the question that should be asked is, what does it cost if we don't file this suit? What is the cost to our children and our families and our neighborhoods if we don't file this suit? Well, I can tell you what it is. Music, PE, art, those are all gone. Interventions, all gone. 30, 30 plus kids in a classroom. I mean, we were told at the town hall meeting by one of the developers, you don't need any schools, you can put all these kids on, you've got plenty of schools. I go, That's like a thousand kids on each school site, minimum, uh, and probably more like 1,200, it'll be 12 to 1,400 for each of our middle schools, which are designed for seven of them, that they were designed for a certain number. We can't go past that, or it's going to start putting a, a, a pressure on the schools. But uh, Dan Burst is certainly telling Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, roughly, how many people would you say are Yeah, and that's a, a great question. Um, what the school district has done is they've analyzed year over year the number of kids that have been produced by the existing housing stock of their boundaries. Um, the, what we don't know is if the homes that are projected to be built are going to deliver um, the same number of students. Uh, when we've attended the city council meetings in the past, they believe there's a housing shortage in the city of Salinas, so that we're not going to see a great influx of students because our existing community is going to populate these homes. That's to be determined. Uh, we've seen in a lot of other districts similar to Santa Rita, that's not what happens. It just becomes a, a commuter town uh, where it's more affordable to commute from San Jose in, buy a home that you can't buy in San Jose. So what we have told the developers is that we believe that there will be between 1,200 and 2,000 students produced out of the West Area specific plan. Um, because we can't account for things like multiple families living in one apartment or one home, which can be the case in the area. Sorry, that's just middle and elementary. Not That does not take into account the high school students. Um, I have a question. Sure. <laughs> Is anybody from the developer here or the city? I don't see. No, I don't see. I know I don't see it's one of the developers, and I don't see anybody from the city. Yeah. I know it was advertised on, I think, SVW, I think they had mentioned it. So I was just curious if, um, if the city has reached out um, since they knew that this town hall was happening, or has the developer reached out since? No. Okay. I, you know, I, there's no other way to answer that. So. The city council, or the city council person for this area, is she even here? She's, okay. She, she's, well, there's two. Uh, Ms. Cromines is ill. She's okay. very sick, so oh. you know, she would not be able to come. Sarah Turner, our board president. 
Hi, I just want to speak to the earlier questions. I really appreciated it in terms of how many students are going to be generated. I'm Sarah Turner, I'm the board president, and I've gone to all of the public meetings about this. And one of the other things that happens at the public meetings that concerns me every time is there's also commercial development in this uh, area where there's talking about a new shopping center, which I have no problems with the shopping center, but they talk about maybe the shopping center is going to have apartments, maybe it's not. You know, and it's, oh, it's flexible, we don't know. And every time that happens, I think I need to count kids. And, you know, so there's just that kind of thing that there's a lack of specificity in terms of knowing what we have to plan for. Um, is that going to be an apartment complex? You know, is it going to be a big box store? Just, you know, let us know so we can try to put together a plan to help these kids. Thank you so much. I want to know if we can negotiate a Starbucks right there. <laughs> Yes. Um, question regarding uh, infrastructure. Yes. Have they even discussed infrastructure? Because if you live in this part of town, you know it's difficult to get around. And I don't see it looking like they're going to widen Brondon and Tibidac or Russell or Rodney. Yeah. What's the plan? Rogi is, if I'm not mistaken, is a county, it's a county maintained road. So that's a county question. I have heard the mayor say publicly that Aranda is going to be turned into a four-lane road. I've heard him say that. I have not seen it in any documents or plans or anything else like that, but I know that that's been said. Secondly, um, when you look at this, just a real quick so I can kind of help you understand it. If you look at this, the yellow outlying areas around the edge are referred to as low-density homes. That's the homes with yards, driveways. Uh, that you see uh, in, in all the neighborhoods around, uh, like in, uh, over in the Hardin Ranch area. And those, a lot of those homes are bigger than these. But that's the low density. Then if you get into these like orange light color, those are referred to as medium density. So those are more like townhomes, a lot like the Rogi Road development across the street from La Jolla. That's what those would be. And then these dark brown areas here, or high density, so that the multifamily dwellings, uh, and that's why I said this is a, a major centerpiece to the development, which is a city park. Um, and then you have small, you have small little areas, play areas, little parks, all around. So uh, a lot of green area, uh, but these are a troubling thing for us when we look at this. Is if you notice each one of these school sites, McKinnon, Sprana, Cantro. And what's is this one? What's their name? Matalo. If you notice, each one of them is surrounded by what looks like vacant lots, but those are all medium density homes. You see it up here. This is a, there's no streets drawn in it. There's no we don't know what the plan is. Where is traffic going to come in and out of those properties? Uh, and it happens over here too. And here you can see uh, right next to the, the middle school site. That's, we need answers to that. What, how, how is traffic going to get out of here? Because right now, the only road existing in this entire development goes from here to there, McKenna. And you can see McKenna now becomes the major north-south travel way through here, and then there's another one down here. Um, and then there's, there's a couple here in the middle. So, so there's three major north-south, and then your east-west is just simply here, here, and that's it. This is, these are not thoroughfares. These are there's going to be exits here. It looks like, but what's happening with these? How many units? How are they going to get in and out of there? Because if you also notice, you can see one, two, three, four roads coming out of this phase one development going right on to McKenna. It can't. There's no way that will work. It just can't. Uh, we've heard that. This is going to be broadened, and there'll be roundabouts put in these to try to keep traffic flowing so there's not traffic light stops. But uh, I've not seen that in a group plan. I've just heard it being said that that's what's going to happen. So I don't want to tell you that's going to happen. I want to make sure I make that distinction. So We're concerned uh, about that. We're concerned about the traffic. We're concerned that if these schools... And here's the, the nightmare scenario is none of those schools were ever allowed in there. Then you've got 4,400 homeowners plus 
multi-families living in single family, all trying to get in and out of there to take their kids to school somewhere, or buses trying to get through these narrow streets to pick these kids up and get them to school. We have to know that you know that that, that environmental disaster. I mean, really, it's uh, it, it's it, it would be terrible. It's already difficult. Can you imagine what it would be like with 4,400 more homes in here? And, you know, they don't widen this. They don't, there's there's got to be answers. We just need answers. I got another question. Question. Sorry. No. no. Um, could you clarify something on Rogi? Because my understanding when I called the city, they told me Rogi now turns into city. I've always known it as county. But I was recently told that they switched that. Could you clarify that for me? You are correct. <laughs> Somebody give her a prize, please, for the back. <laughs> so, I'm Dan Burns, superintendent of high school district. The top line there, above the new high school, Rogue Road, when we built that school, your taxpayer money actually paid for improvements of that road. That was a requirement of our environmental impact report is we had to do improvements on that road. It is now zoned as city property. It's still served by the county today because there's still some transition going on with that as well. I don't know exactly where the city line is, but you know, the road is It's gonna be that road. Really. So in terms of the, the traffic flow question that you asked earlier, so I am attending a meeting with the city this uh, a week from Friday to talk about a four-lane road on Veranda, which will include seven roundabouts. Fortunately, thankfully, uh, the city is reaching out to the schools to be part of that conversation. One of those roundabouts they're planning to put right in front of um, one of our high schools, Everett Alvarez High School. Our concern is, as these developments transpire over 10 years, is how does a student get from one side of the road to the other when there's a roundabout? There's no way to do that. So we need to make sure that we're communicating what our priorities are. A stoplight in front of a school on a busy four-lane road is more important than a roundabout. Thank you. I was on the uh, traffic and transportation committee, and, and uh, a couple of staff members there explained when and they had some meetings even here. I think they had a meeting here for Yarmouth and Roundabout. The pedestrian crossing would be uh, not with the roundabout, but on the far side, it would be further. McKinnon, which they're supposed to be doing that this coming year. That's going to be the first roundabout. They're going to take six years to do six roundabouts. And the first one is supposedly in front of the school. And the pedestrian crossing will be uh, further, I guess that's east, would be further east from the roundabout. So the students, at least from the Hardin Parkway area, will have to walk up further and then cross over, but they're not crossing. So it's another, I guess it's another signal as well. So good luck with the traffic. <laughs> well, I feel so much better after having this <laughs> If I could comment on absolutely. Mr. Burns comments. Uh, traffic signals are significantly more dangerous than roundabouts. I don't remember all the statistics, but if you look at the statistics around about Every problem goes down. The only one I think of, can think of off the top of my head, is fatalities go down 97 percent. That's not chicken liver. Um, roundabouts, just to be really brief, slow everything down, and that lets the bicyclists get in the mix of traffic and get across safely. And it also helps pedestrians get across. There's your reader's digest uh, response. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. I'm not going to debate that with you. I will tell you what our expertise is, is kids. And kids right now kind of know how to use the stop. <laughs> kind of, almost. So we're going to have to do some educating kids on how to use the 
crosswalk before the roundabout. Yes. Because they usually use the quickest way across the street. And it's not just kids, because I think we all do it too. So I think it's an educational piece. So I'm yeah. hoping I'm hoping the roundabouts solve some of the traffic problem with Veranda. Yes. As somebody that lived in this community for 20 years and had to use Veranda Road as well. And now having 10,000 homes built over the next 25 years along the outskirt of Veranda. If it doesn't go to Florence, it's going to be a disaster. So I'm hoping it's, I'm hoping it's a solution for us. Mm -hmm. I do know that when I'm over by the airport, I do watch people drive in circles a little bit. Yeah. So it does take a little bit. That's what we're talking about. Let's talk about it. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. And by the way, it's totally fine to disagree with us. We're, we're, we have, to, we have to learn how to disagree and not be disagreeable. As a district, it's a focus that I've had, you know, the whole time I've been here, the county will tell you. You know, it's okay, it used to be okay to disagree, and now we can't disagree and just say, you have your opinion, I have mine. No, you're wrong and I'm right. And you'll never, you will never ever experience that from anybody in this district uh, when you have a right to, to voice your opinion. So, thank you. Yes, Dan. Hello. I have a question. So, if you're able to make it, it to get the plan change, would you move where the elementary schools are going to be? Because I'm looking, that road you pointed out that goes by McKinnon, the one currently existing, that goes up and north past the Sobrano side and up, where it meets the new extension of Russell Road, that's going to have traffic then. That extension, that little intersection, is going to have traffic, if I'm understanding it right. For the Sobrano site, La Jolla, which already exists, McKinnon, which already exists, and the high school that already exists. So that's going to be all that traffic in that area? That's a great question. And the answer is, we can't get an answer to that question. We, that's what we're doing, is we're trying to get this, it just seems like it was like a runaway toboggan heading down the mountain and people were going to get hurt. We're just trying to slow it down enough. We're not trying to stall. We just want the answers to everything you're asking us. And we want some reassurance that we don't have issues out here that are creating traffic hazards, pedestrian hazards. Uh, these students need to be able to walk with their parents to school. Uh, that's the whole point of new urbanism, is to be you know, eco-friendly, reduce your carbon footprint, and, and actually get out into a community. Well, schools are the cornerstone of any community. I mean, they just are. At least they are in Santa Rita School District. And, and I believe they are all throughout the so, yes. um, Can you, or in the, have you been able to, or in the future, be able to talk to the um, landowners directly, since the developers aren't working with us? <laughs> you know what? Um, we haven't gotten that far yet. Okay. But, but I mean, we're open to anything. I mean, that's right. We're, we want to purchase these sites, so uh, we're not. We're, there's nothing that's not on the table. I mean, so. Is that private knowledge or is it public knowledge? Can What's that? Know? Like who? Who, who the owners are? Yeah. No, I believe they're in the they're in the plan. The, the families are, but these families have multiple owners too. Right. So yeah. you know who's. But that's where it gets confusing. Is how would you know? I mean, one of these sites has 18 tenants in common that own it. So who speaks for the bank? You know, that's the problem. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. So I have two questions. First question it. is, would a walk bridge be an option from... Land bridge. Yeah. <laughs> from, like, the high school over to that area? And then another thing, I live on Kelton and San Juan Grade Road, and... My kids go to La Jolla, and I know that when construction starts here, all the dust is going to be all over the place. So I want to know, like, if the developers are going to have water trucks to keep the dust down, because I don't know if they're familiar with our soil here, but it is very big on valley fever, and we're going to be getting, and there's no cure for that. So, I mean, what are they going to do for to keep the dust down? Like, it's already really bad over here. I don't mean to laugh at valley fever, but I just, I thought I was not feeling good earlier, and now... <laughs> Well, I'm, I mean, it's, I'm a, it's a thing. Getting sick. And then, like, my kids are going to be 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
left to right. So it's going to start here, come up here, and then move over. So when it does that, the middle schools are going to see a little bit because this will be the second school we build. Uh, and probably, it just depends on how fast. Everybody knows if KB Homes buys this, it's not going to take 20 years like they're talking about. It's, it's how long did it how long, oh, sorry. Flash the people one day. How long did it take Hard Ranch to get built? Seven. Seven years. No, probably not. We did that one. Yeah, I've heard six. Is the, that's yeah. the number I keep hearing. And that, and that thing rolled across there. Yeah. And it's done six. It takes, let's talk to our architect friends. How long does it take from start to finish to build a school similar to this? No, just like we purchased this thing, we yeah. It's actually start construction. A year. Well, I mean, yeah. So a year and a half to start construction, and how long do well, another year to have? So, <laughs> good, because I've been telling people three years, and I knew I got it from somebody, and it had to be you. So three years. So if we buy that property tomorrow, uh, it would not open until the August of 2023. That's if we started now. 2023, how many homes are going to be built between now and then? So there might be some temporary housing that goes into McKinnon, and then once we start to build it, we could move the, those, those, you know, those modular uh, classrooms over to the new site. So we may have to do that. My biggest concern uh, right off the bat is where the road's going to go before the homes even go in. You build roads before you build homes. And, you know, just, we have to make sure that there's ways in and out of that neighborhood for those families and that the students can get this, to this school safely. I just, can I, I just want to say thank you for being so proactive and taking this uh, risk on behalf of all the, the kids, families in the Santa Rita area. We're lucky that you're fighting for us. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. No, The opening line in Rick Warren's book, A Purpose Driven Life, is, I always go back to that, the very first line, it's not about you. It's not about me. This is about us. This is about a community of, of teachers and, and students and families and community members and homeowners and people who need to have a voice with this city, who have not had a voice with this city, I mean, probably for 20 plus years. So. You're looking at me, but look at this. I, I tell people the other day, you saw me on the news, everything that came out of my mouth came from these people right here. Every single thing I said was brought up in a strategy session that I had with these people right here. And we include John Gutierrez, uh, our principal at Bolson Knowles, right back there. John, stand up. And, and, and. I just want you to know, John Gutierrez has been in this community as a teacher, as a vice principal, as a principal, and now he's serving on a strategy team to help us come up with a strategy to get this done. And when you have the kind of institutional memory that John has, being here 28 years, 28 years, 28 years, and, and he's on our team. Uh, and, and, and all the principals are on our team, and all the staff is on our team. And all of our parents and our children and our community members are on our team. I just simply was the one that they came and stuck the microphone. That's it, guys. I'm here to serve, and I and I serve with a mighty, mighty team. Right. So thank everybody, everybody, including all of you guys and our community members who come in and ask good questions and tough questions and say, hey, we don't think you're right about that. Why don't you consider this? That is what makes a community strong. When we can have those kind of discussions, that's what makes us strong. It's not about me. I, I, I mean that sincerely. I hope that that's. Not just uh, people in here that don't know me go, man, he's just saying that. It's not about me. Okay? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes, Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you. Just to really accentuate what's being discussed here is Mr. Ryan said, I've been around for quite some time and I was the principal at Gallon View for a number of years and all of you are familiar there with the the uh, stoplight that exists there now that crosses Van Buren and, uh, and Russell. 
And for those of you that have been around for a while, may not know, or may know that it took forever and a day to get that built. And that's why, again, it's all about a voice at the table. Because I can tell you, as one that used to personally cross students there every release time without a stoplight, it was decades, I want to say 20 plus years before uh, one was put there. And the reason was, is it's a multi-jurisdictional area. Uh, the Gavel and View side is county. The other side of the street happens to be city. And then patrolling the, uh, the street there, the road, is actually CHP. So whenever it was time to get the thing built or being asked to have it built to put there, it was always the pointing of the fingers. Uh, it's not us, it's them. And then like this here, I think it just all becomes so nebulous that maybe the people there will stop and it'll, you'll get it when you get it. So more than anything, as Mr. Ryan has said, it really is about having a voice at the table because without that voice, this is going to be imposed, and who knows, maybe these schools that are on this map will end up Natividad Road, three, four miles away from where the students actually live. And then, like as someone said here, then God help us all with the traffic and the safety concerns that come with. So it really is a voice at the table. Thank you. Yes. Well, I, I just want to say thank you to Mr. Gutierrez. That he helped my, uh, my son, Rafael Lopez, and Daisy Lopez cross the street. So thanks to him, my kids, which they already graduated from university and uh, college, I mean, he gave us a lot of help to, my, to me and to more parents. So yeah, I got him for a long time. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Okay, I mean, it's 7 o'clock, but I'm here. I, this is until you drop town hall meeting. I'm not leaving. I'm not telling you that you guys have to leave now. If there's a question left unanswered, it's, you know, it's not going to be because I wasn't here. You know, it might be because you got home and went, oh, I don't like to ask this question. But we're here, so. Yes. Yes. Go back there, Michael. Um, no question. I just want to say that if it's about a school being built and for children, as long as I think it gets done somehow in the safest way, I think you guys would be doing a great job at accommodating that. And obviously, you guys have great people, you know, around to, you know, like she said, have helped students cross streets. And you guys that are watching the development and know the city, um, I think that's just great for everybody. Thank you very much. Okay, right here, go ahead. I just, one thing that I think is needed, because I went, I was president of the Hardin Branch neighborhood, I was president of the neighborhood association when they had the McKinnon issue with the school that uh, was, ended up being 26 houses going into where the uh, school district ended up uh, it was a reserve clause through the government code process where uh, they had two years to purchase the property. Uh, Santa, this school district said uh, we didn't want the property because it was too small. It was also associated with a flood uh, retention area with, uh, with a park that was nearby. Uh, later on, uh, I think uh, the previous superintendent said that uh, they wanted way too much money and I think it was one and a half million dollars back then for the for four acre, five acres. Uh, but basically what the problem is the League of Cities, the city, the cities, uh, the city, the, the county, the counties and the schools put out all kinds of paperwork and even legislation saying can't we all get along? So to speak, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this stuff, and it says uh, some school districts have in, institutionalized processes for working with cities and counties, others don't. 
And since 94, since we had that problem, it was like, okay, we got it resolved. It should be dedicated property. It should be all worked out. I'm sure that everybody's on, at the table to work these things out. I've been to the city, the city meetings where school board members have said, we get along with the city, but it doesn't look like it. And the problem is, let's not go through this process again. Let's somehow institutionalize it on paper, make agreements, make sure that there's a requirement under the general plan that says the city will cooperate and will assist the schools in obtaining property for schools. It's very specific. It's, it's the amendment. The, there's no amendments that came out of that. I'm, I'm citing the 1988 uh, general plan processes or the general plan. So, you know, I think you got a good lawsuit. I hope it doesn't delay things because I know developers will end up suing you on the basis that they lost some money. So you got to expedite this process because they have other tricks up their sleeves. And I know that Eric ended up taking his whole family on a big trip, Ray Herod and group, uh, after we negotiated and, and it ended up that the New Republic School Santa Rita ended up paying a lot of money for that property that was reserved and they could have gotten it for $200,000 an acre. They ended up paying over a million dollars an acre. So, yeah, he took it, it, it just keeps getting better. <laughs> now, now that I know they didn't really you know, tell us we had to go across the street, they just put our school in a swamp. So, that, that was, that was, oh yeah, man, I just tell you, it's just amazing. But um, thank you, uh, and, and what a great venue for you to come and share. That's, that's such good information, and I want to chat with you a little bit afterwards. Um, but thank you, and uh, you know, we're just going to do the right things for the right reasons. I, you know, I tell people that all the time. If, if we do the right thing for the right reasons, if it doesn't work out the way we want it to, we can live with that. Um, you know, but we're gonna hope, we're gonna fight to, to make this work out right. So that's what we're doing. We're, we want to get this done as quickly as possible as well, because you know we're ready to go. I mean, we've got the we want to buy the property. We're ready to go. So this is going to be a tremendous addition to this Santa Rita area and to our district uh, in particular. And, and we got the team that's ready to go day one. Uh, whether that's our architect team or administrative team or our MOT team, our uh, acquisition and, and consulting and attorneys, we're, we're, we got the team, we're ready to go. So, um, you know, uh, this school board has determined that we're going to be heard this time. They we're, we're, were adamant about that, uh, that this is about being heard, acquiring sites, and then making sure our kids are safe. And because, uh, you know, kids, are not going to be safe if they're walking across major thoroughfares and, and, uh, and, and worried about where the, where the traffic light is and where the roundabout is. And they should be able to walk to their schools with their parents because this is about neighborhood kids being built in the neighborhoods for neighborhood kids. And so we just want to thank you for your support. And we'll, we are going to move along with this as quickly as possible. And uh, we will have more information as it comes out. I'll make sure that, that, that there's a press release or uh, we have a Facebook page now. So we've actually come into the early 20th century, uh, the 21st century. Facebook wasn't around in the 20th century. But yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, thank you again. Uh, drive carefully, uh, you know the traffic out there. And then uh, we'll see everybody at work tomorrow. And if anybody ever needs to talk to me, you come by the office and, and we'll get you in and I can talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.